What will be, will be. My mom, my grandmother, they said that for every family tragedy. What will be, will be. And finally, as I got older, I would challenge mom and say, Mom, that's fatalism. You sound like a fatalist. And of course, there are a lot of people who believe in that sort of thing. That no matter what, there's nothing you or I can do to change anything. Everything that's happening was predetermined and will take place exactly the way God wants it. And we have no say in the matter. There are even groups of Christians who believe some people were destined for hell and some people were destined for heaven. Well, if that's the case, why would we give the gospel? If that's the case, why would we come to church and worship? And so fatalism is an extreme that I would highly caution you to avoid. Now, our founding fathers, our country was founded on Christian principles. And so when you talk about men like Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson and our founding fathers, their brand of Christianity was what we term as deism. And I know you're thinking, here we go again, Pastor, another ism. What is deism? Well, this is what they believed that God created the universe and he set it in motion. And this is my version. And he sat back and ate popcorn and watched it. That God just let it go and let it take its own course. So that's deism. And so the idea with deism is that we have personal responsibility. And of course that's true. But it's not all up to us. There's a relationship between us and between God which makes this work and it makes sense if you understand it scripturally. The problem is because we don't understand our relationship with God, and we don't understand the scripture, we tend to gravitate toward one extreme or the other. So, let's talk about this. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 talks about election. And just so you know, the Bible teaches election. The Bible tells us that our names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. That God actually chose us. You're going to see that. But here's the problem. If you just isolate that doctrine out of Ephesians and you don't take the whole counsel of God like we taught you when we taught an interpretation of Scripture, you'll be skewed to one extreme. The Bible also teaches free will. So we need to learn how to understand and marry these things together. But this is what it says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. So first, praise God, you're blessed. You've been blessed by God. Are you a believer? You've been blessed. Not cursed. You've been blessed. And you've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. Now watch this in heavenly places in Christ. So the Bible tells us elsewhere that when God sees us, He doesn't see our sin, He sees the righteous shed blood of Jesus, God in the flesh. And He views us as already being seated in the heavenlies. It's kind of like when you have a, a family gathering. You prepare, you cook, you clean, you set the table, and you just envision your family all sitting together, fellowshipping. That's what God does. The same thing. He sees us as if we're sitting there in heaven with Him. So we're blessed. But watch this, verse 4. According as He hath chosen us in Him, before the foundation of the world. He hath chosen us in Him. That's what election means. But you need to understand it. We love him because he first loved us. There's a relationship going on here. And the idea of free will works into it. And, and the best way for me to explain it, and if you think you understand it fully, uh, explain it to me. Because I don't think any human mind is able 
to fully comprehend how this all works together. But we need to have an idea. So, I chose my wife. And I'm so glad I did. I chose her. I chose her to be my wife. What's the rest of the story? She had to agree, didn't she? Didn't she have to respond? Didn't she, of her own free will, have to say, I really like you, Joe. You're cute. I'll marry you. <laughs> she did, yeah. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. That we should be without blame before we love, verse 5, having predestinated us. Now that's the word that gets everyone in a frenzy. Predestination. What will be, will be. See, mom was right. Well, what I want to talk about today, in regards to prayer, in regards to prayer, is God's sovereignty and how that matches up with personal responsibility. See, it's just like the pandemic. We get information, it's our personal responsibility as to how we respond to that. And so here's the idea. We pray two different ways. If you look at Ephesians 1, we would pray, Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Whatever God's will is, it will happen, it will take place. But to use the old expression, the devil is in the details. How do we get there? And that's really what I want to talk about. Now, if you go to Joshua chapter 10 with me, this is interesting. Joshua chapter 10. Like I said, this is four hours. I'm going to try to finish by noon time. Joshua chapter 10. This is an amazing passage. And it's somewhere in my Bible. So Joshua and the children of Israel are battling with the Amorites. And God has promised them a victory. But I want you to look at verse 12. This is interesting. Now mind you, this is a prayer. This is a biblical prayer. What does Joshua pray? He spake to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And this was his prayer. Can you imagine praying this? Can you imagine the faith that this commanded to change the existing laws of physics? This is what he prayed. Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. He prayed for extra hours of daylight to finish the task. Now, I know what you're thinking. We all want more hours in the day. He actually got it. What does your Bible say in verse 13? The sun stood still. The moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? Do you believe that? I believe it. Mm -hmm. So here we have an issue where God's will will be done. But we have an opportunity in the details, in the working out of fulfilling the Word of God to change things. You've heard the expression, right? Prayer changes things. So how do you match up thy will be done with prayer changes things? You have to understand our relationship with God. And let me just give you a summary before we actually get into the message in case I confuse you all like I normally do. Our relationship with God, which I will talk about next, He's our Heavenly Father. We're His children. We're His little children. So, you're a dad, you have a house. 
You want the house to run a certain way. You want things to be done. You have goals. You have plans. But you love your little children. And so here's the deal. If you're an Italian father and your three-year-old son or daughter wants to make something for you, you hover over them, you nitpick them, and say, no, don't do it like that, do it like this. No, 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 not that. No, you're going to... You get all flustered. You make your kids nervous. You're on them for every detail to do it exactly the way you want it. Or, if you're a normal dad, you sit back and smile because you know in your heart Ain't no way that kid's going to make this. But, because you love them so, and because you're so excited, you just want to see how capable they are. Twice a week I have coffee with my grandson. And it amazes me, as I would put it, what goes on in that puny little brain of his. The things he thinks about, the things he explains, blows me away. And see, that's what God does with us. He loves us. Of course, he's not blown away because he knows. But it pleases him to watch us try to accomplish something. Yes. Even though we may not do it perfectly. Have you ever done anything perfectly? I know I haven't. Do you remember Jonah? Now, don't both things come into play with Jonah? God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach against that great city. What does he do? He gets in a ship to Tarshish to flee from the presence of the Lord. So he exercises his free will and he says, no way, God, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And what does God say? Okay, have it your way. No. God says, this time, you are doing it. And I'm going to make sure you do it. And you know the story. They throw him off the ship. The big fish comes and swallows him. He dies. He's resurrected. And what does he do? He goes into Nineveh under protest. And he preaches. He doesn't want those people saved. But God does. He doesn't want to be used of God, but God wants to use him. So here's a case where God has his way with Jonah. He tried to exercise his free will, and God said no. But what happens to Nineveh in chapter 3? The king of Nineveh, an Assyrian city, the enemies of God, what do they do? They repent, and they cry out to God from the king all the way down to the livestock. And you know what your Bible says in Jonah chapter 3? That God repented himself of the evil and he spared the whole city. Now does God need to repent of his sin? No. God doesn't sin. The word repent there means he changed his mind or he changed his heart. Why? Because he saw human frailty humble themselves and come to him and cry out and he showed mercy and compassion on that wicked city middle. Do you see what's happening? Right in the same book, you have both things. So here's a case, here's a case where prayer changed things. And I'm willing to bet if you think about it, there were situations in your life where you prayed and things changed. And you were grateful to God for answering your prayer. So let's delve into this a little deeper. God's first family were who? Angels. Not Adam and Eve. Angels. The sons of God, remember? Were they all good sons? Were they all good sons? No, 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 no. So who are the false gods of antiquity? They're the fallen, rebellious sons of God. What did they do? They rebelled against their father and against their family. So they have no sense of respect 
for their father or for their family. So what does God want? God wants a family, just like you and I. He wants a home, just like you and I. But the first family, there was a problem. So he starts another family, Adam and Eve. And what happens there? They sin. But God shows them grace and mercy and atones for them. I want you to go to Genesis 3. And look at verse 21. There's something very important here, and you already know it, but I need to emphasize it with you. What does God do for Adam and Eve when they sin and disobey the only commandment they have? Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. So what does God do? He makes a blood sacrifice because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. Why is that? As much as God loves and forgives, He's holy and righteous. And so here's what we need to understand about God. His love never negates sin. His love will never negate disobedience. See, we do that with our children, don't we? When we enable them. But God's love reinforces His holiness and righteousness. So because He loves us, and because He's holy and righteous, He doesn't enable or excuse the sin. He rectifies it by atonement. He pays for it with the only payment that's acceptable, the shedding of blood. That's how you got saved, wasn't it? Amen, preacher. That was not for free. That cost God a lot. Let's move on. <clears throat> chapter 4. What happens in chapter 4? Adam and Eve have a son. His name is Cain. Then they have another son. His name is Abel. And how are they teaching their children to worship God? They're teaching them to bring a sacrifice. Why? That's what God taught them. So what does Abel do? He brings the firstlings of the flock and he's accepted. And what does Cain do? He says, well, I'm a farmer, so I'm going to bring the things I grew. The work of my hand. But it's bloodless. And so what the Bible says in chapter 4 is that God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but did not accept Cain. So now we have a problem. Now we have a problem in chapter 4. Unto Cain, verse 5, and to his offering he had not respect. And so what did Cain do? I'm so sorry, my father. I brought you my very best. I thought you'd be pleased. Since you're not, I'll do what you want me to do. Is that what he does? What's he do? He gets mad at his father. He gets angry. And the Lord says to him, Why art thou wroth? Why is thou countenance fallen? If thou doest well. You know what that word doest means? To sacrifice. If you just bring the required sacrifice, shall you not be accepted? But if not, sin lieth at the door. So what does he do? Does he go back and bring the correct sacrifice to satisfy God's holiness and righteousness? To be embraced by the love of God? Because that's what the sacrifice was about. It brought you peace and joy and enveloped you in the love of God. What does he do? He goes and he kills his brother. So think about this. Because we all have dysfunction in our family, don't we? All of us. Well, there was dysfunction in God's family too, by the way. We don't like to think about that. But Adam and Eve, the very first person born on the face of this earth was a murderer. Think of that. The very first. And who did he murder? His own brother. Why? Because he was mad at God. 
Wow. Go to Ephesians 3, verse 14. Do you remember what the first seven verses of Ephesians 3 is about? It's about the mystery of the church, right? He's talking about the church age being instituted. He's talking about church. But skip down to verse 14. He says, for this cause. That's the cause he's talking about. I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, here it is. Of whom the whole family, do you see that? The whole family in heaven and earth is named. Why does he use that terminology? God wants a family. That's what this is about. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to what? Comprehend with all saints the breadth, length, depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ with passage. Oh he wants us to know God's love. Why? We're his children. We're a family. Do you understand this? What happens at the end of the Bible in Revelation 21? I, John, saw the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, descend from God out of heaven. And what does God say? I will be their God. They will be my people. And I will dwell among them and wipe away every tear from their eye. Doesn't he say that? What's Revelation 21? What is time about? Time was created on the first day of creation in Genesis. There was light the morning and the evening of the first day. That's time. What happens at the end of the Bible? The end of time. Well, what is happening in between? Signpost after signpost after signpost. Noah. Preach for righteousness. God loves you. Won't you trust Him and be part of His family? Moses, the law. You have sinned, but God wants to forgive you so you can be part of His family. Jesus Christ comes. He dies on the cross so that you and I can be the children of God. It's the hugest, can I say that? The hugest signpost ever. I love you and I want you to be part of my family. We have lots of folks who want to be part of our family when it's Sunday dinner. God wants you to be part of His family. That's how we got saved. But at the end of time, whoever believes, they're the children of God. We're His family. So in John chapter 1, the very first verse I learned, as many as received Him, verse 12, as many as received Him, how do we receive Him? By faith. To them gave he power to what? Become the sons of God or the children of God. Even to them who believe on his name. How did you become his child? By believing. And let me tell you this. He is so glad you did. Because you are fulfilling his good pleasure. Ephesians 1. You are fulfilling his desire to have a home and a family. He is glad to have you, just as we are glad to have our children. I want to turn to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John 3, we start at verse 1. This is interesting. He says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Imagine you're with God. You're confronted by Satan. 
And God says, no, no, that's my son. Imagine that you hear from the very lips of God, I say that as a euphemism, you're my son, you're my daughter. What could be better than that? We bear the name of Christ. What on earth could be better than that? My dad who raised me was not my biological father. But from the time I was four years old, he raised me with all the love that a father could give a son. And when I was in ninth grade, the legality of things finally came through that I could be legally adopted, that's biblical, right? And I could take my father who raised me, I could take his name Scarborough. Won't tell you what my name was before. But I had it till ninth grade. It was pretty weird going to school and having everyone say, what's your new name? Why'd you change your name? What's up with that? You have the name of Christ. What could be better than that? You're getting me excited. I'm going to move on. I want to talk about fidelity. Fidelity is something that families should experience. You have children. Maybe they weren't perfect children. Maybe they didn't please you. Maybe you weren't the best parent. It doesn't matter. But God loves us unconditionally. And to the best of our ability, we are to love our children unconditionally. And no matter what, they will always be our children. And here's the thing. You marry a woman. What happens? Each year, you drift further and further apart. And then you split up. <clears throat> then you try again. Then you drift and drift and drift. And you repeat the cycle. But what is the problem with that? Biblically, when we talk about biblical fidelity, we should love God more the longer we're saved. And the longer we're married, our love for our wife or our husband should grow and grow and grow till it's unexplainable. We shouldn't get bored with each other. We shouldn't be annoyed by each other. The love should grow. It's infinite love. When my other grandson was two or three years old, we got this goofy video that taught letters. So he would play it over and over again. And he was only like two and a half. And he was learning letters. So then we got another video that taught numbers. And we were astounded at how quickly he was learning. And so one day I said to him, I said, Jack, what do you like better, letters or numbers? And he said, numbers. Now, I was pretty surprised. He's a young kid. Kids don't like math, do they? The only time they do math is when it involves money. And I said, Jack, why do you like numbers better? You know what he said? Because they go on forever. Are you with me? Numbers are infinite. And this is what we need to comprehend about the love of God. Listen, what do you and I know about God? Well, we have a Bible. But how well do we know our Bible? It says we have the mind of Christ. We have the Holy Spirit. We have experienced the Christian life. But really, how well do you know God? He says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, my thoughts are above your thoughts. So guess what? We don't know nothing. We hardly know anything about God. And I'm going to tell you something else. This is for free, Brother Ron. We have no human concept of God's infinite fidelity and love for us. And if you ask the question, why would God love me? Well, the answer is because He's God. But He loves us in spite of ourselves. He loves us more than we love ourselves. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. 
John 3.16, God so loved the world. How did he satisfy his righteousness and his holiness? He took our sin upon himself. I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this fidelity, this love. God, the one whom we hardly know at all, who lives dimensions beyond us, loved us so much, he decided to become a man. He emptied himself of his glory, his reputation, that's what the Bible says, and became a man. He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's what the Bible teaches. He loved us so much, He became one of us. Amen, preacher. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Lisa got you all a clock so she could point to it when I went over. So we need to hurry. Make that Romans chapter eight. My wife copied my notes down in here. I just thought. Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For if the law could not do that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Amen. He became one of us to take our sin upon himself. Go to verse 14. Skip down. We don't have a lot of time. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, the children of God. Ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. We're children, we're legally adopted. We cry, Abba, Father, dear Father, dear Papa. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with them, that we may also be glorified together. And then he says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time aren't worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Amen. Go down to verse 31. And then I'm going to explain something to you. Verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, the sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Why? Because he loved us. I have persuaded neither death nor life, angels, principalities, powers, things present or things to come, height, depth, or any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. That's infinite love. You need to understand this. Our God, the Creator God, the true and the living God, the one and the only God, is the God of all the universe. And He is offering mankind, His children, His creation, something very unusual. So see if you can understand this. The false gods of antiquity 
were the rebel sons of God who rejected the family. And so when people worshipped false gods, the false gods were competing among themselves for the worship of the people. They were also competing with their father for the worship of the people. And because they have no sense of family, they want you to worship and serve them to appease their anger. So if you study ancient cultures and their worship, they worship false gods to appease their anger because they were afraid. Do you understand what I'm saying? So our God, the true and the living God, offers mankind something that all ancient cultures couldn't understand. This God isn't angry. He loves us. This God isn't looking for appeasement. This God is offering me legally to become his child, his son, his daughter. The idea of a loving family relationship, the idea that we are the sons and daughters of the true and the living God, that was foreign to every ancient culture. It was foreign to the worship of every false god, but it was offered to each one of us. That's why it was so popular. It's that fidelity. So, now we come to personal responsibility and free will. God is powerful enough to make you do whatever He wants. He could program you like a hologram video game, but He doesn't. Why? He wants you to freely worship Him. He's given us free will. So, free will is like fire. You can burn a house down or you can cook a meal with it. Free, free will is like a knife. You can make a, a wonderful dinner or you can stab somebody. You understand it cuts both ways? Do you understand what I'm saying? So free will can be a blessing or it can be a curse. But God wants to be worshipped freely. That's why he didn't program us. So what's the problem with that? Why is that an issue? Well, just as time was created by God, because at the end of the hourglass, there's either redemption or judgment, and we want to be redeemed through faith, free will was given so that you and I would have a choice. So, it's like I go into an Italian restaurant, and there's ten things I want, and I can't decide because they're all so good. That's not what's happening here. Because you have free will, God's giving you a choice not between several things that are good. God's giving you a choice between good and evil. Do you understand what I'm saying? If evil doesn't exist, your free will is worthless. God's looking for you to freely make the right choice. That's why there's evil in the world. So that you and I will choose God. Now, we can parse that out a little bit more. His Holy Spirit convicts us. His Holy Spirit invites us. We love Him because He first loved us. Flesh and blood hath not revealed that unto you, but my Father, which is in heaven. Do you understand what I'm saying? But we need to respond with that freely. We need to, of our own free will, repent and trust Christ in order to be saved. So evil must exist in order for you and I to maintain our status of free will. See, God could have wiped out Satan the moment he rebelled. But he didn't. See, when I was growing up, you did something wrong, you got whacked immediately. Dad never waited. Mom always said, wait until your father gets home. <laughs> Amen, Brother Joe. Why does God allow Satan to have free reign over this earth? Now, in your Bible, he's called the God of this world. There's principalities and powers 
in darkness in high places, right? Why is God allowing all this demonic activity? Why doesn't He just get rid of them? Would make our lives so much easier. Because He wants you to have the choice. He wants you to have the choice of which God you will serve. Free will. Joshua 24. I'm running out of time, so I'll just give this to you. What did Joshua say? He said, you need to make a choice. Will you serve the gods that your fathers served on the other side? The gods of Egypt, the ones God judged. And he said this. There's a plaque in my hallway at home. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He said, choose ye this day whom ye will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now our text is in Matthew 4, but I'm not going to read it to you because you know it so well. Jesus is carried by the Spirit into the wilderness, and he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. Think you could do that? Don't worry, I know I couldn't. But it says afterward, he was in hunger. He was in a very physically weak state, and he was tested or tempted by the devil. Remember? He said, if thou be the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. What did Jesus answer him? He quotes Deuteronomy. Well, if you look at Matthew 4, 1 through 11, he takes Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple. Now remember, it's on the top of Mount Moriah. And then the temple's pretty high, and then the pinnacle's even higher than that. And what does he do? He shows him all the kingdoms of the world. He lays everything out before him. And Satan says to Jesus, if you worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. And Jesus says, no you won't, because I already own them, they're already mine. Is that what the Bible says? No. Does Jesus ever contest that Satan was allowed to be in control of this present evil world? Does he contest that? The answer is no. So why is God allowing Satan to be in control of this cosmos? So that you and I have a choice. But I have good news. There's finality. Here's another aspect of our relationship with God we need to understand. So God has a will. God has a program. God sees the beginning from the end. And he's so secure in his sovereignty. He's so secure and he's so pleased with the relationship that he has forged with each, each one of us who have trusted him that he's not too excited about the details. He gives us some free will. He allows things to happen. He does it partly with us because he loves us and he wants us to learn. But what about the bad stuff? What about the devil? Well, he allows him to go as far as he goes because God knows the outcome. The victory's already won. Listen, where are you going to go when you die? Where are you going to go? Do you know that? Are you sure? Are you excited? I'm ready today. Let's go. So what makes our life easier to live than unsaved people? We know how it ends. How does eternity make God secure in his sovereignty? He already knows how it ends. The devil's defeated. What happens in Revelation 20? At the beginning of Revelation 20, there's a thousand year kingdom where Jesus rules and reigns in righteousness from Jerusalem. But what happens at the beginning of the kingdom age? Michael comes down from heaven with a chain. And he binds Satan. And he casts him into prison for a thousand years. Amen. Hallelujah! He's going to be in prison for a thousand years while you and I enjoy a kingdom with the curse lifted and Jesus ruling and reigning. How about that? Amen. Sometimes I wonder if any of you are saved. <laughs> you ought to come up here. It's exciting up here. <laughs> But what does it say in 
Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, it says this, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Amen. Forever and ever. Amen. Why? It was prepared for the devil and his angels. God is secure in his sovereignty and he allows the movement in our relationships to further our relationships and he allows the evil and the tragedy to go beyond what we would be comfortable with because he's secure in the outcome. He knows how it ends. There's finality. It will be put down. And that's when there's the new Jerusalem. That's when he will be our God and we will be his people. That's when there will be no more tears, pain, death, sorrow. All things are new. Why? There's no more evil ever. Amen. Ever. So let me give you what, what I have to close with. Prayer not only changes things. It is according to the will of God. But prayer moves the hand of God. Amen. Prayer moves the hand of God. Amen. When He sees you seeking Him, when He sees you praying, when He sees you trying to uh, grow in the Word of God, when He sees you have a heart for Him like David did, Amen. it pleases Him so much, He blesses you. Prayer moves the hand of God. Father, we are so grateful for our church family. We are so grateful that you see us as seated in the heavenlies. We're so grateful for the free will you gave us to forge a better relationship with you day by day. Help us to take advantage of it, Lord. And I pray you bless us this day. You'd be with us this afternoon. You'd bring us back tonight. You'd bless our missionaries. And then you'd watch over our church family, Lord. Bless each one, and may we all experience your unending love this day, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless.